Edit audio. It rained after they disappeared. And it rained pretty hard. The things that I was thinking of, Stacy doesn't have a coat. She doesn't have anything to keep her warm if she's just in her t-shirt and bikini pants. And I had a dream that told me she was in a just a wooden chair with a high back and that her arms were tied behind her. On the last episode of the Springfield Three, it was on June 7th, a full night after the girls' graduation, that Stacy McCall, Susie Streeter, and Cheryl Levitt were reported missing by the police. Yeah, and then the, the cigarettes and the lighter, and I'm thinking, well, you know, this is not typical. There were no signs of a struggle that I recall, but I don't think they left their, of their own free will. Let's go back to the house on Del Mar. Remember that Stacy's mom, Janice McCall, had arrived at the home the following evening after graduation. The sun was just setting, and it was almost dark outside. And here's what she found. All three of their cars were parked in the half-circle drive, and their purses were neatly lined up inside. They left behind cigarettes, a lighter, hundreds of dollars in cash, and essential medication. Stacy's shorts and bra were neatly folded, and her jewelry was tucked into the pocket of her floral shorts. The only thing missing was the t-shirt and her underwear that she wore that night. I looked around and I saw by the end of the bed, I saw Stacy's shoes with her, her shorts on top of it. Not her t-shirt, but her shorts and her brand new Victoria's Secret bra. And um, so that was all that was there. At this point, about 16 hours had gone by since the girls allegedly arrived at Susie and Cheryl's home on Delmar Street. Janice calls the police, and remember, 911 was just introduced at this time, and the town was instructed to use it only in emergencies. This didn't feel like an emergency, and everyone, including Janice and her husband Stu, were waiting for the women to just walk in the door at any moment. On the night of June 7th, police officers left a note on Cheryl's door asking her to call the police department and cancel the missing persons report when she and the girls returned home. It's now June 8th, two days after the graduation. Police list the women as missing, and the search begins. After we cleared the residence, we went back to headquarters, as I recall, and we called everybody we could think to call. We called all the hospitals in the area, not just in the city. Uh, We called all the county jails in the adjoining counties to see if any one of them had maybe been booked into jail, and we just couldn't find them. This is The Springfield Three, a podcast about the disappearance of three women who forever changed a small Missouri town and the people in it. It was at this time that the house at 1717 Del Mar, the home where the women were presumably taken from, became sort of a landmark. The women's vehicles, a blue Corsica, a red Ford Escort, and a Toyota Corolla, were still parked in the circle drive, but the women who drove them were nowhere to be found. That house, the one at 1717 Del Mar, is situated on the fringe of Springfield's Roundtree neighborhood, a historic and one of the most sought after neighborhoods in town. Cheryl's was a modest home on the smaller side with stone detailing in the front. It had pretty arched doorways and hardwood flooring throughout the house. It was just a block or so from one of the busiest streets in town and easily accessible to the highway. I want to paint a picture of this house for you. It's been nearly 30 years and a lot about this town has changed, but this house hasn't, and I wanted to see it for myself. I wanted to place myself in the home where these women were likely taken from so long ago. Springfield may have grown since I was a kid, but the degree of separation is still quite narrow. I have an old childhood friend who knew the current owner of 1717 Del Mar. His name is Ryan, and he was kind enough to let me go inside. When we pulled up to the house, there was no chance of mistaking it. In fact, if you were to compare a picture of the house from 1992 news clippings to the one we were staring at, the resemblance is nearly identical. 30 years later. Here's a recording of the tour that I took with our producer, Allie. And for some reason, Allie and I were a little on edge about the whole thing. It didn't help when a very large dog nearly scared us to death. Oh my god. That dog <laughs> scared me to death. Oh my god. So it appears that the glass in the window 
I'm not sure if it's the original glass, is broken out on one side. There's also a gigantic dog that looks like it could have done that. That scared me. <laughs> not be home yet, so. What am I hearing? Traffic from. Oh, God. I'm really scared. Hi! Hi there. Are you Ryan? Ryan, yeah. Hi, Ryan. Okay, thank you. When we arrived inside, Ryan was listening to what I think was an episode of Stuff You Should Know. He went to put the large foster dog in its crate. Is there anything you can tell us about this house that you know? Something that's original or... I mean, it's, it's mostly all original. Like, I, uh, I mean, they, someone after, like, you know, years, years ago, years after the incident, they built this office on here, and I just knocked it out because... An office, in quotation marks. I don't know. It was a weird closet on, on your living room. Uh, Allie and I walk into a large living area with a window that looks out onto the front lawn. It's the same window you see in all of the images from 1992, and from this vantage point, it would be easy to see if someone pulled into the drive. There's a sunny kitchen and a modest bathroom. It wasn't hard to imagine Cheryl's tidy bedroom or Susie's graduation robe slung over a chair. Storage for me right now. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I think uh, this was the room. This was Susie's room, I think, that was a little bit larger. Oh, yeah. Back here. They called it a bedroom. The yeah, home still has the small set of stairs that leads to Susie's sunken bedroom, where she had posters of famous blondes on the wall and clothes and stuffed animals strewn about. It was here that the women's purses were lined up. There was a sliding door and a dog door that opened to a large backyard. And according to a police report, there were two slats in the blinds that had been separated, as if someone was looking out the window. And that was a door to the garage, and then they just made it a carport, made this an extra room, and put a wall up, was my guess. But but this, I mean, would definitely, I mean, mean, I've I've done enough research to know that, uh, that they used the carport. So do you get a lot of requests? No. You don't? No. Oh. Uh, just uh, a couple high school kids, like on the 25th anniversary, knocked on my door. Uh, and they just, yeah, and they just, they were just asking if they could do a story, like, from the sidewalk. And I was like, well, yeah, oh, I don't wow. care okay. about that. Yeah. But then, uh, like, whenever the people, I get I get a lot of drive-bys, you uh, know, looky-loos and stuff. Is that um, weird? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sitting here watching for people to drive by. I guess it's kind of weird when you're mowing and... Yeah. People drive by like six times, you know. Yeah. But yeah. Like circle around. Yeah, they'll turn around and keep driving back, and they'll yeah. go. They'll park across the street and s- stare. It doesn't happen a lot, but like like when that People magazine thing came yeah. out, then they like when every time there's something like that, you get a little uptick. Allie and I didn't stay at the house long. Ryan was kind enough to give us a tour, and we didn't want to invade his and his dog's space. But in some ways, it was unnerving. Being in this house that looks so similar to the images in 1992 was eerie and even a little bit heartbreaking. If Stacy and Susie hadn't driven here at the very last minute, it could have easily been Cheryl who opened the door for me that day. So back to June 8th, just a couple of days after the disappearance, the case has now been determined as a missing persons report with foul play suspected. And it was right there at that very house, the one we were just in, that Officer Bookout asked Janice a question that would bring any mother to her knees. He said, can you obtain dental records for Stacy?" Janice was a dental hygienist and knew that if the police wanted dental records, it would be to identify her daughter's body. Within days, more than 20,000 bright yellow posters of the missing women were printed and hung on telephone poles, storefronts, truck stops and gas stations, and bars and restaurants. It had the word MISSING in all caps, splayed across the top, with a picture of each woman, their names and ages, and then the telephone number to the police department. Here's a news clip of Janice, just days after the disappearance, talking to a reporter while passing out these flyers. I'm Mrs. McCall, and this is my daughter. Okay. And they're missing, and we'd like to put posters in your windows, on your doors. Okay. I feel like I'm in a bad dream. I want to pinch myself and wake myself up, but I'm not asleep. I saw her graduate Saturday night. We were there, and now she's gone. We don't know where. When I hear these old news clips, I can hear the pain in Janice's voice, not unlike when I met with her earlier this year. They weren't doing everything that I felt like they should. 
The police or the news? Anyone. <laughs> Anyone. I wanted my daughter, and I wanted her right then, and I wanted her found. Can you imagine if your child went missing? Honestly, I can't. But I can imagine that every time you'd see a young woman with long, dark blonde hair, you might think it was her. You'd probably imagine what she looked like now, and maybe catch your breath when you graze a similar face. You'd probably hold out hope every single day. Time ticks away, and on June 9th, the FBI was called onto the case. 30 Springfield police officers are working nonstop, all assigned to investigate the three missing women. They had several detectives. They had a total of 32 detectives at that time, and they assigned different people different things. Well, the first day, they didn't do too much. They just got a, a few things out. But by by the next day, by Tuesday, it was starting to really boil up and start to overflow. And they had a lot of more things doing, and they started a search. And I remember that the people that used to live with it next door to us in Ravenwood before we moved out to Cherokee Estates, one of them was a police officer, and I called him, and I said, do you know what's going on? And he says, yeah. He said, we're going we're gonna to find her. Don't worry. We'll look for her. We're going to find him. Didn't realize he was going to drag rivers and look through the forest and everything else and all the wooded areas. David Asher was the lead detective on the case for the Springfield Police Department. We began, we divided things up with people that were assigned to us in addition to my my officers. And uh, we hit the, hit the road, got busy. We ourselves searched the house for additional evidence. Uh, we went through every piece of evidence that was taken from the house to see what, if anything, could be there. By June 9th, everyone in the Springfield Police Department was working on the case, and everyone else in town was racking their brains for anything that could help. Brenda Kane and her family lived down the street on Del Mar. You know, people were talking to each other and thinking about things that could have happened that they didn't notice. And was there any information that was overlooked that they should be reporting? Um, I had a, a friend, actually, that lived in the neighborhood, and she just had a newborn. And she was up in the middle of the night with her newborn, and she that particular night she heard a woman scream. And she reported it, but, you know, nothing came of it. You know, everybody was hypervigilant and really racking our brains to make sure that there wasn't anything that that we didn't need to report. Everybody wanted to help. By now, the Springfield News Departments were reporting nonstop, and it was really all that anyone in town could talk about. Uh, my name is Robert Keyes. That's spelled K-E-Y-E-S. Robert Keyes was the primary reporter on this story for the Springfield News Leader. In fact, he reported on this case for many years. I was the cops reporter for the Springfield News Leader. The days and the weeks and the months all bleed together because I, I, I covered that story. I was probably the primary reporter for the story for the news leader for the first couple of years. And I just remember being so incredibly stressed out because every day there was this expectation that, you know, reporters felt an obligation that we were going to solve this thing. Right. So we were chasing leads that didn't make any sense. And because they were leads and a lead was a story. And so it was so not really frustrating, but just just stressful because you would write about it, hoping against hope that it might mean something, but it, it just never did. That week on June 11th, CBS's 48 Hours started filming the investigation. The women were also profiled on several national TV shows, including America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, sparking tons of calls and new theories. But as we'll later learn, some think that these shows had an impact on how the case turned out. Here's David Asher. Because it just so happened 48 hours was in town or nearby. And uh, they popped in and our chief of police authorized their involvement. And finally, on June 12th, the first lead comes in. An anonymous tip in a sealed envelope is left in the newsleader paper box in a grocery store. It reads, quote, Use Roos of Gas Man checking for leak, unquote, and leads police to check the Bolivar Road apartments. But it turns out to be a dead end. The same day, six divers search the shores and depths of Springfield Lake and a stretch of James River. Nothing turns up. 
Police asked for the public's help in finding two vehicles that were stolen in Springfield the night the women disappeared, a burgundy Toyota Supra and a dark blue 19-foot Dodge van that had been converted into a motorhome. As for the timeline, it's now been five days since the women have been missing. On June 13th, the community of Springfield was urged to help in the search. Remember, this town is surrounded by miles and miles of woodlands, creeks, and dense forest. Here's Brenda again. Whenever hunting season started that year, Stacy's mom asked and made a plea to all hunters, hikers, everyone to be on the watch for anything that they might find because she was hoping that they might find the girls' bodies. The community goes to work and 60 people search for the women on horseback, all-terrain vehicles, and by foot. Everybody is working overtime. Police are working extended shifts around the clock trying to find Cheryl Levitt, her daughter, Suzanne Streeter, and Suzanne's best friend, Stacy McCall. We are still asking for individuals that may have had contact with either the McCall girl, Ms. Streeter, or Ms. Levitt to make contact with our department so we can narrow down the time frames that we're working with as to physically when was the last time they were seen and known to be safe. It's June 14, 1992, and a week has gone by since the girls' graduation. The police's command post is still getting tips around the clock, but none of them pan out. Rick Bookout manned the command post and followed up on several leads in the following days and weeks. And so I remember being in that command post and people would come up in the, you know, all hours of the night and the early morning, knock on the door and, you know, want to give you tips. And we had what, what, what we called tack days back then. The squads had days built into the schedule where you just worked on special assignments. And so that's what you did on your tack days. You followed up. They were on like three by five cards mm -hmm. and you would follow up everything that came in. I remember going to Stockton Lake on two different occasions. Stockton Lake lies about an hour from Springfield, and it's where my own family often went to go fishing. Do you remember what that particular lead was? Once my sergeant and I went up there, there was a, a fisherman who uh, said that he, when he brought in his artificial bait, he said it had blonde hair on it. Mm. So we got with the water, we met water patrol up there. They had some divers that dived that area and it turned out to be just a particular kind of moss. And then, uh, I think another time, same, the sergeant and I went up there, met water patrol and they were checking out a lead of, uh, something that smelled deceased in the woods. Mm -hmm. And so we went by water, they had some people on foot and it turned out to be, a a deceased uh, coyote, as I recall. I remember another time going into another neighboring county where they said there was a, a, a large trash bag with something dead in there, and it was just fish. But, I mean, that's what you did. There, there were any large bodies of, of wooded areas in the city. They were, they were searched. Robert Keyes remembers the police grasping at any possible lead that came in. They were searching fields and <clears throat> ravines and caves and oh my god the cops searched so many places every day they would have a press conference and they just had nothing and you could tell that they were stressed because they wanted people to believe that they were on it but they weren't on it because they didn't have a clue what they were dealing with laura bauer was a journalist for the springfield news leader she was the police reporter and crime reporter for most of her years there and her memory for this case is astounding she too remembers the desperation. People would tell me early on in the investigation that they were told if you see buzzards circling in the air, go below it and search that area. If somebody calls in and says there's a smell in a trash can at the fairgrounds, go check it out. They were really grasping at straws. On June 15th, police went back to the house at 1717 East Delmar Street. Officers are working a fresh tip that neighbors saw a transient near the home the days prior to the disappearance. A picture of the man, with long hair and a full beard, is released. The next day, on June 16th, an image of a green van is issued to the public. This green van would become a symbol of hope in the next few weeks. And really, it still is to this day. There was this van <laughs> that turned up strangely, and I don't even remember how, somebody had phoned in and said that she saw a van that had pulled into her driveway and there was 
a scared looking young woman in it who and a voice in the back that said, turn around and don't do anything stupid. And so this van uh, became a symbol of hope for solving the case. But there's still hope around every corner, and it comes in the form of tips. There's a new one from gas station clerk Steve Thompson, a 24-year-old who said that he saw the women that night. And while fact-checking the details on this, the times are a bit off. And that may be because Steve had miscalculated, or that media outlets had different accounts. One statement says that he saw the women on the night of their graduation, that they had come in and bought a few items and left in separate cars. He said that Stacy McCall was in an older gold model car with a man in his early 30s with dark stringy thin hair and a mustache, perhaps not unlike the man whose picture was just released and printed in the newspaper. He said that the man popped his head in the door and said he forgot to buy cigarettes. He later told police that he heard the girls talking about meeting up later that night. One girl drove south and one drove north. And then he claims at 2.15 a.m., Cheryl Levitt came in and asked him if he'd seen her daughter and two friends. He said that she seemed nervous and left. And all of this seems plausible, until the friends of Stacy and Susie's, who were actually with them on graduation night, say that the two never went to that gas station. Another tip to come in was from a waitress at Georgia's Steakhouse. It's a 24-hour diner kind of place that I went to in high school. The food is cheap and greasy, and it's the kind of place you went to with your friends probably after a party. And on June 7th, one day after the graduation, a server at Georgia's reported seeing the women between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. Well, the Georgia's, they swore they saw them, and that's only, a, oh, maybe a three-quarters of a mile from their house. So it's not very far, just straight up north on Glenstone. A young waitress stated that the three women arrived together and left together. She said that Susie appeared to be drunk and that they were with three men. Could it be that the girls arrived home about 2.30ish a.m. and then decided to go out to eat after a night of partying? But if they did go out to eat at 3 a.m., why would they leave their purses and cigarettes and wallets at home? On the next episode, we're going to delve into some of the leading theories that emerge. We'll learn more about that van and about Cheryl's past. We'll learn about a group of grave robbers and about a boy who tells the story of seeing the women in the woods, a story that would haunt him for the rest of his life. They're out there checking it out, as we all did, and this van comes out of nowhere. Three guys get out. They've got three women. The women are terrified. The Springfield Three is an Edit Audio original production created in collaboration with Ann Roderick Jones. The series is written, researched, and hosted by Ann Roderick Jones. It was produced and edited by Ali Siwa with executive producing from Steph Colburn, Sophie Shin, and with lots of help from the rest of the amazing Edit Audio team. The archival news clips you heard in this episode are from KY3 News. Theme music was written by Patrick Rindle and Ali Siwa and was produced by Patrick Rindle at Studio Dolly. And thank you to Ryan for opening his home on Del Mar and to all of those who share their stories with us. 